My name is Eric Allen, and with me here is uh, Mr. Kent Freeland. Hello. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight's Torah portion is Behor. I can't say that right. But uh, Leviticus 25, 1 through 26, 2. And we will be discussing what that has to say in a minute. But please, let us go now before the throne. Thank you, Father Yahweh, for this, your Sabbath day. And thank you for the food that we've eaten. Thank you for your many blessings you put upon us. And thank you for giving us a day to study your Torah. And thank you for giving us your Torah, your instructions, which teach us how to be a righteous nation, your chosen people, how we should be behave, and teach us how we can prosper and by your word. Thank you for giving us these instructions and let us learn from these instructions and Study these instructions and diligently seek your will. In Yahshua's name we ask, make it so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, again, thank you for joining us. We are doing Leviticus 25.1 through 26.2, to our portion known as Behor. Uh, shalom, John, and shalom, everyone else. Shalom, John. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And without further ado, we shall begin reading... Leviticus 25, reading starting at verse 1, and then we'll read all the way through chapter 26, verse 2. So just essentially one chapter is all we're getting this week, but it's a good one. All right. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall observe a Shabbat Sabbath to Yahweh. Six years you sow your field, and six years you prune your vineyard and gather in its fruit. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a, have a Sabbath of rest, a Sabbath to Yahweh. Do not sow your field, and do not prune your vineyard. Do not reap what grows of its own of your harvest, and do not gather the grapes of your unpruned vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be to you for food for you, and for your servant, and for your female servant, and your hired servant, and for the stranger who sojourns with you, and for your livestock, and the beasts that are in your land, all its crops are for food, and you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourselves, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you forty-nine years. You shall then sound a ram's horn to pass through on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the Day of Atonement, cause a ram's horn to pass through all your land, and you shall set the fiftieth year apart, and proclaim release throughout all the land to its inhabitants. It is a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his Plan. All right. Thank you, John. I'm glad I'm feeling better also. Thank you for your concern. Thanks to all everyone for their prayers. And this week I plan to do an update on YouTube to catch up on the portions which I read, which are on Hector's computer, which I can't put on YouTube right now. And also for the week which we missed, do a brief interlude on those and get us ever off to speed. I'm going to do that on the YouTube channel. That's what I plan to do. And I apologize for not being on YouTube for a while. But, yeah. All right, thank you, John, for your concern. Yeah, I'm glad I'm feeling better, too. We pause there at chapter 25, verse 10. Now, if we continue here, and if anyone has any comments, you may interrupt at any time. And that includes you, Mr. Kent. Okay. Whenever you feel like, <laughs> and whenever you feel like uh, making a comment, go ahead and post it in there, in, in the chat room, and we'll get... We'll get that addressed, 
And if Mr. Kent, if you have anything to say, go ahead and just say, Eric, I got something okay. to say. <laughs> anyway, chapter 25, verse 11. And the 50th year is a jubilee to you. Do not sow nor reap what grows of its own, nor gather from its unpruned vine. For it is a jubilee, it is set apart to you. Eat from the field its crops. In the year of the jubilee, let each one of you return to his possession, and you shall sow whatever you your what and you and when you sow whatever to your neighbor or buy from from the hand of your neighbor, do not exploit one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, you buy from your neighbor, and according to the number of years of crops he sells to you, according to the greater number of years you increase its price, and according to the fewer number of years you diminish its price, because he sells to you according to the number of years of the crops. And do not oppress one another, but you shall fear your Elohim. For I am Yahweh, your Elohim. And you shall do my laws, and guard my right rulings, and you shall do them, and you shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield its fruit, and you shall eat to satisfaction, and shall dwell there in safety. And since you might say, What do we eat in this seventh year, since we do not sow nor gather in our crops? Therefore I have commanded my blessing on you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth the crops for three years. And you shall sow in the eighth year, and eat of the old crop until the ninth year, eat of the old crop until its crop comes in. And the land is not to be sold beyond reclaim, for the land is mine, and you are sojourners and settlers with me. And provide for a redemption for the land in all the land of your possession. When your brother becomes poor and has sold some of his possession and his Redeemer, a close relative comes to redeem it, then he shall redeem what his brother sold. And when the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since its sale and return the remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he shall return to his possession. And if his hand has not found enough to give back to him, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of the Jubilee, and it shall be released in the Jubilee, and he shall return to his possession. And when a man sells his house in a walled city, then his right of redemption shall be at the end of one year after it is sold. His right of redemption lasts a year. And I should say only a year. But if he is, if it is not redeemed within a complete year, then the house in the walled city shall be established beyond reclaim to the buyer of it. Throughout his generations, it is not released in the Jubilee. Now, earlier today, Mr. Kent and I were talking about that, and we were talking about in modern times, how Iraq or trying to compare that, and he said, if if you if I bought the land and then I built a house on it and sold it to somebody else, now if I'm within a walled city, I'm fully within my rights to do that. There probably already is a house on it, and you have only a year to return me the money which I gave you for the land, and if you can't, then it is mine. <laughs> well, um, to clarify, it again, we're talking about a house. Yes. In a walled city, we're not talking about the land. In a walled city, the land of a walled city is owned by the inhabitants of the walled city. So, the reason there's a difference there is a house, unless it's rented out, I guess, would be one way that it could quote-unquote make money. But if you read 
what's being told to you here, nobody's renting out a house because everybody should have a portion. There wouldn't be a need for somebody to rent a house unless they're um, not given a portion. Um, but that house would then be released because there's no way to productively gain something from the house. It, it's not earning you anything. You didn't plant anything in it. it. It's not a producing item. Whereas land, on the other hand, it's talking about how the land is providing income. So that's why the land needs to be given back because when you sell it to somebody, they're still making something off of it all during that time frame. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we read here, it says, according to the years of crops, the crops are what's being sold. So when I sell you the land, I'm selling you the crops you're going to get from the land. The land is, belongs to Yahweh, and he's given it to us to watch over and to guard. And if I'm from one tribe and... and you're a stranger sojourning with me, or you're from another tribe, or you're just my brother even, and and something goes haywire, and I'm not able to work my land, and I need, you know, if I break my leg, or even if I die, my wife with young children, no one to work the land, however it goes, they, they, can, they can say, well, look, we have this, and this, it's going to yield this many crops for... So for six years, you can have this if you give me enough money to sustain my family. So it, it is, it's basically selling the crops and not selling the land. And then when the Jubilee comes, you have the, the contract is, is up. You have Your debt has already been paid but because you bought the crops and you worked the field and you took the crops that it, that it would yield. Which is why when you buy it back early, you're paying back the price of the crops that would have been already paid for. It doesn't say that you're buying back the land, it's only saying that you're buying back those years of crops. You have to replenish that what you quote unquote were given to be able to get the land. You have to give that back if you're trying to buy it back before the Jubilee. You can either wait till the Jubilee and it's it's everything is good and said done because that's the completion of the quote unquote contract or you have to bring something to pay for the amount of time frame if you're doing it earlier. All right, any other questions or comments on that? Thank you, Mr. Kent, for your elaboration. Mm. <laughs> um, not seeing any, so we'll move on. But that's the difference between a house and crops. But anyway, as now, as for the uh, houses of the villages, we we'll pick up here in 2531. The houses of the villages, however, which have no wall around them, are reckoned as the field of the country. A right of redemption belongs to it, and they are released in the Jubilee. Now, as for the cities of the Levites, and the Levites, and the houses of the cities of their possession, the Levites have a right of redemption forever, and that which is redeemed from the Levites, both the sale of a house and the city of its possession, shall be released in the year of Jubilee, because of the because the houses and the cities of the Levites are their possession in the midst of the children of Israel. Mr. Kent elaborated on that also when he said that a house cannot produce any money, but unless you have nothing else besides the house, so the Levite can 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 sell you that house, but he has a right to buy it back at any time. Sort of like a land share type of <laughs> situation where you, where you buy it, pay all this money, but but uh, it's still not your property. It's, it's you buy it, you're paying the right to use that property for a, for a period of time. <laughs> so, anyway, um, So, verse 25, 33 again. And that which is redeemed from the Levites, both the sale of the house and the city of his possession, shall be released in the year of Jubilee, because the houses in the city of the Levites are their possession in the midst of the children of Israel. But the field of the open land of their cities is not sold, for it is their everlasting possession. So, they are not allowed 
to sell, to sell you the crops of the field. They're not allowed to sell you the field. They're allowed to sell you, let you have their house for for a price, and they're allowed to buy it back for a price. But the field is is where they would dwell on their in a in a tent in their field while you, while you're dwelling in their house. That field is theirs forever. They're not allowed to let you have those fields. They're, those crops are theirs, and they're not to be sold. So, anyway, that is their possession from Yahweh. They, as you as we recall during the Exodus and earlier when we were allotted the land, they were not given a portion. Yahweh is their inheritance. So that that land among the uh, among the Throughout the tribes of Israel, there is to be given certain cities and the outlying fields that is theirs, and they must always retain possession of it. Anyway, continuing on. And when your brother becomes poor, and his hand has failed with you, then you shall sustain him, and he shall live with you, like a stranger or a sojourner, take no interest from him or profit, but you shall fear your Elohim, and your brother shall live with you. Do not lend him your silver on interest, and do not lend him your food for profit. I am Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim to give you the land of Canaan to be your Elohim. Now, reading ahead in Deuteronomy 15, it's going to say, if you do lend to him, right now it says, do not lend to him, but if you do lend to him, do not have an evil eye. But here it says, do not lend to him. It says, you will sustain your brother. So, you will sustain your brother and you will give to him. You don't worry about in the year of Jubilee, when, the year of the release. You're not going to worry about whether he's going to be able to pay you back or not, you're going to give it to him freely. And there's not going to be any question about it. You're going to say, lest there be no poor among you. There's always going to be poor, of course, but the issue is, if you see your brother in need, you take care of him. And don't worry about ever getting any crops from him. Don't worry about getting anything from your brother for profit. Take care of your, bro take care of your Hebrew brother. This does not apply, of course, to strangers or sojourners within the land. They, they can serve as servants or indentured servants to help pay back the money that you're sustaining them. But your brother, no. You don't expect anything of him. Well, there is, there is some words that's added to that. And it says, if his hand has failed with you. Now, I don't know the exact idiom that it's speaking to there, but I'm going to take a, a slight walk and say, if somebody's hand has failed with me, I'm not sure if that means that they've done something wrong or if that means that they're unable to work in the fields at this point. And maybe that is why it's speaking to the fact that you would not ask for interest because they have no physical way to physically repay. So if that is the truth, then that would be why you would sustain them as opposed to ex have expectations that they might be able to pay um, extra money. Of course, this is also speaking to a brother. So it's somebody who's near you. Um, but that would be something I would point out. That's a good point. Uh, just like a couple of years ago, I got bit by a dog. I went down to uh, Missouri, back to my home state to do some work because that was the only work that was available and plus I missed all my people out, my friends out there and my family out there in Rochport so I said I'm going to go back down there and visit everybody and 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 I'm going to work and and hopefully make a profit well the first route I did here comes a pit bull right in the middle of the street he's walking peacefully down one side of the street and I see him I didn't recognize that as a pit bull and didn't really think much of it and I'm walking on the other side of the street paying attention cautiously but I'm in and I'm dropping a phone book, and all of a sudden, here comes this pit bull charging right at me. And, and so, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the only time I've ever been bitten by a dog, and hopefully the only time I'll ever be bitten by a dog. But it did, it did limit my ability to perform the work which I had planned to do. And the brother I was staying with, instead of giving him money to, to 
as I thank you for renting his for renting his house, he ended up giving me money not to work. He says, here, no, you're not going back to work. You're going to sit here and you're going to rest your leg. You're going to soak in Epsom salts and you're going to get this taken care of. And he said, and he, he said, here, 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 take this. You want money? Here, take money. You're not going back to work. That's so my hand had failed. And, and he sustained me exactly the way Taurus said. So <laughs> I guess that does work that way at times. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Anyway, continuing on here. But that clarifies in Deuteronomy chapter 15, where it says to lend to him, and, but here it says not to lend. There's no discrepancy at all. They're both saying the same thing. There's a qualifier. Yeah. There's a qualifier, yeah. Um, so anyway, verse 40. But as a hired servant, okay, Okay, we'll go to 39. And when your brother dwells with you, who dwells with you, becomes poor and sells himself to you, do not make him serve as a slave, but as a hired servant. And as a settler, he is with you and serves you until the year of Jubilee. And then he, sh- and then he shall leave you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his own clan even return to the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, who I brought out of the land of Mitzrayim. They are not sold as slaves. Do not rule over him with harshness, but you shall fear your Elohim. All right, so... In Daniel, and in Ezekiel... I think it's more in Ezekiel than it is in Daniel, but also in Jeremiah it's calculated, the years that they will be in captivity. Uh, I have not done this as a full study. I'm just throwing it out there as a conversation point. If someone else has done the study, they can find out whether it's true or not. However, Michael Rood was the one that introduced me to the study. He says that the years that they were in Israel and did not keep the Jubilee did not keep the, the seventh year land Sabbaths. If you have a day for a year and you add all that up, the it will work out to the 70 years that they were taken off into captivity and the land observed its rest for that. That's interesting. It's an interesting point. I haven't done, haven't done that study. However, we have an abundance of scripture on the other issue. It says, in the seventh year, if your brother sells himself to you as a servant, you will not make him serve with harshness. You will you will treat him as a as a brother. You uh, here says you also you can treat him as a hired hand, but you will not make him serve with harshness. And you will release him in the seventh year. So if we go over here now to Jeremiah and chapter thirty four. Yeah, Jeremiah chapter thirty four, verse eight we'll see that the children of Israel didn't even do that. We can speculate that they didn't release the land, that they didn't let the land rest, but they didn't even let their Hebrew servants rest and release them. So we pick up here Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 8. The word which came to Yermiyahu, Jeremiah, if you will, from the from Yahweh, the word which came to Jeremiah from Yahweh after sovereign Zedekiah Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim a release to them that everyone was to set free his male and female slave, the Hebrew man and the Hebrew woman. No one was to keep a Yehudite, his brother, enslaved. And when all the heads... Uh, and all the people who had come into the covenant heard that each one was to set free his male and female slaves and not keep them enslaved any longer. They obeyed and released them. But afterward they changed their minds and made the male and female slaves return whom they had set free and brought them into subjection 
as male and female slaves. Therefore the word of Yahweh came to Yahu from Yahweh, saying, Thus said Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, I myself made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage, saying, At the end of seven years, each one should set free his Hebrew brother who has been sold to him, and when he has served you six years, you shall let him go free from you. But your fathers did not obey me, nor incline their ear. And you recently turned and did what was right in my eyes, each man proclaiming a release to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house, which is called by my name. But you turned back and profaned my name, and each of you took back his male and female slaves, whom he had set free at their pleasure, and brought them into subjection to be your male and female slaves. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, You have not obeyed me in proclaiming release, each one to his brother and each one to his neighbor. See, I am proclaiming release to you, declares Yahweh, to the sword, to the pestilence, to the scarcity of food, and I shall make you a horror to the reins of all the earth. And John says we have lost sound. That is interesting. I don't know how to fix that. Does anyone else have sound? How do I fix that? We frozen. Our video is good, but our sound is no, not. We've frozen. Huh? Our video is frozen. Really? Yeah. Now it's moving. We froze for a moment there. And now we're back on again. Wow, oh, I'm not hearing the echo. I got the speaker on. So we still don't have sound. Refresh we, did not work. Refresh oh, did work. Refresh did work. Okay. So you can hear us. All right, I guess you can hear us. I can't hear me, but okay. I don't know. It says refresh did work. I'm going to go to the site. All right, yeah, we're going <laughs> to pause now for a check to make sure everything's working well before we continue. Sound is good. We lost it only for a second. Okay. Let's hope we don't lose it for a third. All right, we're continuing on. All right, we were reading in Jeremiah chapter 34 about the time when the Israelites did not release their male and female Hebrew slaves as they were supposed to. And John says it must just be mine. Okay. All right, I'm glad everyone can hear me. and Hopefully everyone's up to speed here. Uh... Now, see, if we're, all right, we'll continue reading here. Uh, in verse 34, verse 18, and then we'll elaborate. And I shall give the men who are transgressing my covenant and who have not established the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut off the covenant which they made before me when they cut off, when they cut in half the two, when they cut the calf in two and pass between the parts of it, the heads of Yehuda and the heads of Yerushalayim, the eunuchs and the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf, and I shall give them into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their life, and their corpses shall be food to the birds of the heavens. How's, how's it working, Mr. Kent? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> and I shall give Zidkiahu, sovereign of Yahuda, and his heads into the hands of their enemies, and into the hand of those who seek their life. Yes, yeah, so I can hear him. Yeah. And into the hand of the sovereign of Babel's army that has withdrawn from you. See, I am commanding, declares Yahweh, and shall bring them back to this city, 
and they shall fight against it, and shall take and burn it with fire, and I shall make the cities of Yehuda a ruin without inhabitant. So as we just read in Jeremiah chapter 34, starting at verse 8, going all the way through 22, the children of Israel took male and female servants of their Hebrew brothers, and they did not release them into seven years. And now, just as they were slaves in Mitzrayim, the ones who are slaves now to other Hebrews, the Hebrews who are holding them slaves, are just as bad as the Mitzrayites, and now they're going to be taken off into Babel, into captivity, and the people who are being held captive by their Hebrew brothers will be set free. Yahweh is all about freedom. He said that he came to set the Hebrew people free, and he made a law saying the Hebrew people were never going to be slaves again. And now Hebrews have taken other Hebrews as slaves, and now the Hebrews who are slaves will be set free by the Sovereign of Babel. So the Sovereign of Babel is coming to take them away because of transgressing that covenant and profaning his name. And Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain, who brings his name to naught. So, anyway, we now return with our regularly scheduled Torah portion. <laughs> Someplace here it is. <laughs> Alright. So that's with the Hebrews. Now, if there is a soldier among you or a foreigner among you, there are, it's not the same. Forty-two or forty-one. Well, I thought we were beyond that, but we'll read it anyway. Who cares? All right. Especially since we were silent for a while, and we were quiet, and hopefully we're not always quiet right now, and hopefully everyone can still hear us. But anyway, going back to Leviticus twenty-five forty-one, and he shall leave you, and his children. I have not read that. You're right. All right, and he shall leave you and his children with him, and shall return to his own clan even return to possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Mitzrayim. They are not sold as slaves. Do not rule over him with harshness, but you shall fear your Elohim. And your male and female slaves, whom you have from the nations that are around you, from them you buy male and female slaves. And also, from the son, from the sons of strangers sojourning among you, from them you buy, and from their clans who are with you, which they shall bring forth in your land, and they shall be your property. And you shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them as your possession. And they are your slaves for all time, but... Over your brothers, the children of Israel, you do not rule with harshness over one another. We just read Jeremiah chapter 34, what happens if you do? Now, when a sojourner or a settler with you becomes rich, and your brother with him becomes poor, and sells himself to the settler or sojourner with you, to a member of the sojourner's clan, after he has been sold, there is a right of redemption to him, one of his brothers does redeem him, or his uncle or his uncle's son does redeem him, or anyone who is a close relative to him in his clan does redeem him, or if he is able, then he shall redeem himself, and he shall reckon with him who bought him the price of his release according to the number of years from the year which he was sold to him, until the year of the Jubilee, as the days of a hired servant is with him. So again, he's not selling himself, he's selling his labor. And he says, I will work for you for seven years at $55,000 a year. So you give me the $355,000. It's actually more than that, I'm just doing the math roughly in my head. 
but you give me the money right now, and I will serve you for seven years for that money. But then he serves him for a while, and, and, and his brother comes along and says, you should not be a servant, and will give back the money to the man, less, of course, any labor which was already performed. But he will be able to, re his brother will be able to redeem him, or if he has been able to work overtime, the money, the, the, you, you, I work for you eight hours, then I have eight hours to work for myself, I work for you 12 hours, I work four or five hours for myself, and working by himself, he's been able to raise enough money, he can again say, well, I'm, I can, can I pay you back the money that you, you, you pay me, I can, and, and go work for myself again. And he can, and he's legally allowed to do that. So, again, it's the labor that's being sold and not the person itself. And in the year of Jubilee, it, the contract is, uh, is done. And all that's are not, it's not that as far as that's concerned. He, his, he's worked for you seven years. And he agreed to work for you seven years for a price. You paid him the price. So everything is free and clear. There's no such thing as a release of debts as far as that goes. Um, all right. If there are, okay, now I just explained this, we'll read it. <laughs> and he shall reckon to him who bought him the price of his release to be according to the number of years from the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee as the days of a hired servant with him. If there are many years according to them, he repays the price of his redemption from the silver of his purchase. And if few years are left until the year of Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him, and according to his years, he repays him the price of his redemption. He is with him as a yearly hired servant, and he does not rule over, rule with harshness over him before your eyes. And if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall re be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him, because the children of Israel are servants to me, they are my servants, who I brought out of the land of Mitzrayim, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Alright, any more comments or questions? John, can you still hear us? <laughs> so, and if you can't hear me, then you're going to just say, no, I can't hear you. To, to make a quick comment, you had asked that I read some information about some current information that is out there and five myths that kind of go with the Jubilee. Um, I, I, I will read the five myths and we'll kind of discuss them real quick, but um, I will say that the five myths seem to be something that has something to do with um, political correctness in our current age. So I'm not sure if these myths are uh, hold much water, but the first myth is is that the Jubilee means a forgiveness of debts. Um, what they speak to there is is that um, that at the time of Jubilee um, everything quote unquote was forgiven. But if you read it correctly like we've just discussed here, nothing's being forgiven that the time of Jubilee, everything is coming to completion. So it's the, the debt is paid off at the end of Jubilee, not that the debt would still be standing after that point. It, it, it's come to completion. Um, but the myth is, is that, you know, people shouldn't have to live their whole life in debt. So um, the, the teachings of Yah says you're supposed to give forgive people their debt. I would say in this case, it's not talking about the forgiveness of debt, it is talking about the fact that there was a system set up where a person could truly pay off their debt. They could come clean, they could do what they needed to do, and if they wanted to do it early, then they would pay off that amount, but they would have to collect and pay it off. Um, so there's some, some cherry picking to kind of come up with that, um, because obviously there are slaves and there are other things that are discussed here where there are some people who aren't paying off their debt, but they are servants over a certain time frame. And then there are others who are going to be servants most of their life. So that was the first myth. The second um, 
has to do with um, restribution of wealth or land, and it, it's, well, redistribution. I don't think it's a redistribution because, as we've already discussed, the land is owned by Yah. The land is given to us, and Yah has expectations as to where the land is supposed to be. So it's not that it's being redistributed to everybody to make them once again landowners again, so that it's some mentality that everybody must own a home and we must figure out a way to let them own a home. <coughs> that was the point, basically, in the first place when Yah said, here's the land, make sure everybody gets a portion, and everybody could then, if they were going to do the work, they could build a home, they'd have a home. But it wasn't that, you know, all of these these pieces of land and homes being passed around are being done because people have had um, income issues or crop issues or whatever the reason may be. They didn't have enough income to sustain themselves. Um, and, you know, there's probably some scriptural things that are written that would obtain to why they weren't handling their money properly. So I don't think it's a redistribution thing either. <clears throat> and it kind of goes on from there. It, it, it would get drawn out pretty far. Um, the article that you might want to look for if you want to read it and have your own ideas about it is um, entitled What Are the Five Myths of Jubilee Mean for Poverty? Um, there's two separate places where the exact same article is published. One is the Gospel Coalition, and the other one is the... You told me it. The Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. So if you'd like to look that over, if you have some opinions, if you want to look at it right now, um, we'll, we'll discuss the other things, but there's some things out there that are trying to lead people into accepting current-day... Uh, I would say political ideas when the scripture is much more clear that um, Yah is setting forth ways to properly live on his land, properly take care of his land, properly take care of the people of the land and I don't think there's very many government institutions out there who are wanting to accept the scripture completely because if we were living by all of those, the land would be blessed. If we're not living by those, the land isn't blessed. And clearly, sometimes the land isn't blessed. So, Good point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. You made it. another point about, uh, about irresponsibility or, or, or spending the money in, incorrectly or, or, or not wisely. And, of course, you made the point about disobedience. And that goes right along with the next two or the last two verses, the next two verses of our reading. I mean, why would people fall into a problem with not having enough money to pay their bills, needing to sell themselves into being a servant, needing to sell the land in the first place? Of course, circumstances, as I said, if, if the man dies, in, especially in battle or, or what have you, and the woman's left with young children, there are legitimate circumstances. <laughs> and there's also other real good reasons why... I mean, things happen, and things happen for a reason, and that could help you enter into, into a relationship with the stranger who's within your gates and enter into a friendship. We don't have any reason to speculate what happens there, but we can read the scripture about one other issue which will cause you to fall into debt. As Mr. Kane has already said, disobedience. And we see here in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 1 and verse 2, to complete the reading, it says, Do not make idols for yourselves, and do not set up a carved image or a pillar for yourselves, and do not place a stone image in your land to bow down to it. For I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Guard my Sabbaths and reverence my set-apart place. I am Yahweh. So Sabbath violations will be, of course, violating the uh, seven-year Sabbath on the land, not treating the land properly. The land will not yield its crops. Actually working seven days and not trusting Yahweh to be your provider. It is He that has made us and not we ourselves. So now Yahweh says, you want to be your own provider? I'll show you what you can do. 
You must sit back and trust me to be your, be your provider on the Sabbath and take the Sabbath off as I commanded. Then I'll pour out my blessings. You want to work the Sabbath thinking that you can provide for yourself better? Well, here's what you can do. So, we can see how people can fall into poverty through their own thinking and through their own disobedience. As far as that goes, and the uh, Greek word for idolatry here would be porneos. So we have another idea without going into detail about what can be idolatry today and what it actually was back then. During the uh, Greek to English translation, the words have basically similar meanings. But we're not going to go there. That does conclude this portion. We have also our half Torah for our portion here. It's in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 6. We're going to read ver Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 6 through 27. And what Yahweh says about the, the year of release of the land, and the, everyone returns to his possession. Jeremiah was instructed to purchase some land. And Jeremiah who said, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, See, Hananel, son of Shalom, your uncle, is coming to you, saying, Buy my field which is in Ananoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. So Hananel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the guard, according to the word of Yahweh, and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Ananoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is yours and and the redemption. Buy it for yourself, and I know that this was the word of Yahweh. So the Babylonian troops are coming to take everyone off the land. Uh, Jeremiah's nephew accordingly had fallen into some, some problems, so he sold the land to a foreigner. And now Jeremiah is being told, buy it and pay back the land so I'll, I'll still own it, so I can get it back. And Jeremiah... and a logical person would say, well, the Babylonians are going to take us off the land anyway, so what does it matter? But Jeremiah had to prove that Yahweh is our provider and he proved that we are going to return to the land, went ahead and bought the field. And Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah Yahoo 32, verse 9, And I bought the field, which was in an anoth from Hananel, my uncle's son, and weighed out to him the silver, 17 shekels of silver, and I signed the deed and sealed it and took witness and weighed out the silver in the scales. Then I took the deed of purchase that was sealed according to the command and the law which was open. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Meriah, in the presence of Hanamiel, Hanan, Hanan my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witness who signed the deed of purchase before all the Yehudim who sat in the court of the guard and I commanded Baruch before their eyes saying thus says Yahweh of hosts Elohim of Israel take these deeds both this deed of purchase which is sealed and this deed which is open and put them in an earthen vessel so that they may remain many days for thus says Yahweh of hosts the Elohim of Israel Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. And after I had given him the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, I prayed to Yahweh, saying, Ah, Master Yahweh, see, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is no matter too hard for you who show kindness to thousands and repay crookedness to the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great and mighty El, Yahweh of hosts, is his name. Great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. For you have set signs and wonders in the land of Mitzrayim to this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and you have made yourself a name, as it is, to this day. And you have brought your people, Israel, 
out of the land of Mitzrayim with signs and wonders and strong and a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great and fearsome deeds. And you gave them this land of which you swore to their fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came and possessed it, but they did not obey your voice, nor did they walk in your Torah. They did not do all that you commanded them to do, so you brought this evil upon them. See the siege mounds, they have come to the city to take it, and the city has been given to the land of the Chaldeans who fight against it. Because of the sword and the scarcity of food and the pestilence, and what you have spoken has come about. And look, you see it. Yet you, O Master Yahweh, have said to me, Buy the field for silver and take witnesses. Although the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Then the word of Yahweh came to Yahweh, saying, See, I am Yahweh, the Elohim of all flesh. Is there any matter too hard for me. Alright, go along with that. We also have Luke 4 16 through 21. And we'll read that real fast. Where Yahshua is reading out of the book of Ishaya. Ishaya. So. Yahshua is reading out of the book of Yeshua here in Luke 4, chapter 16, chapter, yeah, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. <coughs> and we're actually going to start with 4 14. And Yahshua returned in the power of the Spirit of Galil, and in the power of the Spirit to Galil, and news of him went out through all the surrounding country. And he was teaching in their congregations, being praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And according to his practice, he went into the congregation on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu was handed to him. And having unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to send away crushed ones with a release to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh and having rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all the congregation were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's interesting that the healing of the sick and healing of the blind has been taking place. And of course, the, uh, the year of vengeance of Yahweh, which is spoken of later on in Yeshayahu will be fulfilled also. If we read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll start, actually, okay, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And because the Master himself shall come down from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of the chief messenger, and with the trumpet of Elohim, and the dead and Messiah shall rise first. So we do know when your Messiah comes back at the seventh trumpet, after this, they say seven years of, of tribulation, it, it would be the year of release, the year of everyone returning to the possession and the kingdom being set up. We see that happening in prophecy. Another advice Paul gives going back to being if you're able to redeem yourself a slave being able to redeem himself Paul goes in, in that's First Corinthians chapter 7 verse 21 that's the last verse I have for you if anyone has any other questions or comments and unfortunately John did not answer the question so I guess he can't hear us 
and I apologize for that, John. You'll hear us on YouTube, and you'll hear my apology then. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know if that's my fault or not, but everyone else seems to be able to hear. Alright, and verse 21 here of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Alright, let each one, in verse, first, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 20, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called, will you call by a slave? It matters not to you, but if you are able to become free, to rather use it. For he who is called in the master while a slave is the master's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is a slave of Messiah. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. We just read where it says, You are my servants. You are my slaves. Yahweh said, You are my slaves who I paid for. I brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. You serve me, and you are not to become servants of men. And, of course, the regulations and statutes are given where you will be released in the seventh year and if you can buy your freedom or if your brother can buy your freedom for you they will buy your freedom again and that's what Paul is saying here again if you are able to become free rather become free and if you're called while you're free do not become a servant of men so that's all I have for you this year or this week <laughs> if you have any questions or comments uh, now would be a good time to type them in and if not, then thank you, Father Yahweh, for this, your Torah. And thank you for letting us study your Torah. And thank you for giving us the spirit of understanding as we read your Torah and elaborating on us and teaching us your ways. Help us to go about this week with your kingdom in focus, with your kingdom in mind. As we go about our business, let us stay aware of the fact that we are also doing your business. Let us be representatives of you, of your Messiah. May the people see the Messiah living in us and be drawn to your truth and be drawn to your freedom because of the way we conduct ourselves in the world. May we stay kingdom focused and may your kingdom come. And may we be working diligently to bring the kingdom. In Yahshua's name we ask, please make it so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Alright, that concludes this session of Torah School.